So if you're thinking to yourself, this is a very unusual machine, I've not seen one like this before, I can guarantee you um, that that's true. You haven't seen one like this before because it's a one-off. Um, it's a machine that I made over a number of years and I thought uh, in today's video, maybe in one or two parts, I'll share with you some of the challenges in making it um, and some of the techniques I used along the way. Um, I tried to use hand techniques as much as possible for the simple reason that uh, I didn't have a workshop at the time um, and getting work done outside was, was difficult, um, always there were delays and uh, sometimes it was expensive. So I thought uh, I'll try and make as much of this machine uh, myself and uh, this story is about how I did that. So you're probably wondering to yourself, how did I make a bed from scratch by hand? Well, I had um, access to uh, steel stockists here. Um, I didn't have any bright mild steel section. Uh, um, so I had to use uh, what we might call black bar, hot rolled, which was very um, imperfect in dimension, very poor surface finish. Um, in fact, you can see a little bit of uh, the poor surface finish left there. Um, so the way I did this was actually by, by filing it. Um, I filed um, the ways flat, straight and square. Um, I'm not sure if I can go into all the detail of how I did that, but how did I get the, the bed flat and straight along its length? Well, the way I did that was um, by making a set of gauges. And uh, again, this is, this is um, not uh, high precision engineering, but it's what you have to do if you are starting from scratch. So the whole process of creating a straight line or a straight edge in order to file the bed straight and flat and later on square uh, started with these three gauges. Again, it's just made from um, hot rolled steel um, and um, I started by basically filing gauge number one against gauge number two and then once I had a let me put two on this side once I had um, a reasonably good match uh, looking for light between the two then I would take number two off and then I would put number three on top and again aim for the same and then of course what happens if I put number two against number three when I reviewed my video clip I realized that uh, it wasn't really a very good explanation of how to make straight edges so I just produced this uh, simple schematic here uh, you will have noticed from the video clip the material I had available was uh, hot rolled steel so it had plenty of mill scale on it so the first task was to uh, clean up uh, one edge each on, uh, on, on each of the bars, indicated here as bars number one, two and three. 
I uh, marked them so that I could uh, identify them throughout the process. And also, um, just for reference, they were one and a half inches deep by three eighths of an inch thick. Um, that's uh, 38 millimeters by 10 millimeters. And the length was the full length of the bed of my machine. So um, after cleaning up, uh, we end up with three bars with one reasonably clean edge on each um, uh, filed to shape. So um, of course I'm aiming for a straight line, but let's assume um, for this explanation here that all three end up slightly convex. Now the first stage in the process is to assign bar number one to be the gauge and that's on top of bar number two which is held in the vise and the dotted line there shows the straight line that we're aiming for and the value C is the deviation from the straight line um, uh, along the length of the bar and a typical value I think uh, for, for, for me was around about uh, 20 thousandths of an inch or half a millimeter uh, of, um, of um, deviation from a straight line for, for the bars. So that gives you kind of a ballpark figure to, to realize the amount of material that needs to be removed. So after um, using bar number one as the gauge and filing bar number two, we end up with this situation uh, where um, the gauge is slightly con convex and the work is slightly concave and both deviate from the straight line by the value C. So the same process is followed for bar number three. That's also filed in the same way and we end up uh, with um, a similar shape. So bar number three and bar number two after this process are similar in shape with a similar amount of um, error uh, in them, both being uh, concave. So far, we haven't actually removed metal in such a way as to improve the straightness of any of our workpieces. Now, however, by placing number two and number three um, on top of each other, we have a combined error of two C in the middle, and uh, we have the benefit of knowing that both are equally out of straightness. So if we remove the same amount of material from the ends on each piece, we will definitely improve uh, um, their, their um, the deviation from the straight line. So having done that, um, we should end up with um, two bars. Um, one may be slightly convex and the other slightly, slightly concave, but we can guarantee that the error will be much better than C and uh, most probably less than C over two. So I, if we started with half a millimeter or 20 thou of error, it should be now better than quarter of a millimeter or 10 thou of error. Now we have a new gauge. Before the gauge was bar number one, but now we can take either bar number two or bar number three and use that as our new reference point or reference um, gauge. So at this point, we start the process all over again. And we continue with this until you reach the desired um, level of accuracy. Um, several iterations around the loop and you will end up with something that's quite usable for the purposes that um, certainly I required in, in producing this lathe. on the whole length but is 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 straight between the end the middle and this end at three points so once I've achieved that then I go to the next level of gauge and I have three of these similarly these were slightly different they've gone a little bit rusty now but you see they have lands don't know if you can see that so three distinct points. Again, remember this was all done by hand. So similarly, these have numbers. And uh, so 
this is removed and I work on the smaller gauges. So again, the same process is followed. I'm able to end up with seven points, seven points along the length of the gauge, which are in a straight line. So that's how I developed a straight line. In fact, the whole accuracy of my lathe is dependent on these simple elements. And all the work I've done on that machine over 20 years has been developed from these gauges, and that's why I kept them. <laughs> Uh, they're not worth anything to anybody else, but they're, they're kind of a reminder to me of how um, my workshop developed and where my straight lines and straight edges came from. It's another story how I got the surface plain, flat. Um, basically, I use these gauges to get the top of the bed flat or plain, um, and then I used other techniques for getting the, the, um, the other surfaces of the bed square. So I hope that's uh, helpful. Um, maybe some pictures will help illustrate this later. So a closer look at the uh, headstock. Um, this is basically one casting. Um, uh, they are plain sp split bearings, so cast iron on steel. Um, and the, there is no adjustment in them. The only way of um, removing any, any movement, which I have done a few times, is to um, is to remove some material from from the half bearings um, so that they they come down uh, more um, reduce the diameter effectively. So there are no shims in there; um, it's all solid. Um, and uh, as to there have been surprising little wear despite twenty years of use. The lubrication uh, just through these two oilers, um, and um, um, it's been remarkably successful actually. The um, the bed actually I had to make the bed in two parts so the, the headstock portion of the bed is detachable and that does have shims in it and uh, that was to ensure alignment now I don't have any welding plant um, I didn't at the time and I still don't so this 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 work had to be done outside and then brought back and so anything any design features I had to bear in mind um, that it had to be quick and cheap to produce, um, but also um, allow for adjustment and, and modifications at home to get things uh, aligned and accurate. So this is the, the solution I came up with. So the, the main portion of the bed and this portion of the bed are separate uh, and there are six uh, uh, three eighth diameter bolts holding the two parts together. And then the headstock actually sits on a plinth. This plinth is firmly bolted to the bottom of the headstock portion of the bed, but the top part um, uh, can rotate. So it can rotate in this direction for alignment, and if necessary, I can pack it this way, shim it this way, to get alignment in this direction. Uh, as it turns out, I think I achieved that by, by shimming here. I don't think I've got any shims in there. So long ago that I did it, I can't even remember. Um, so the lathe has back here. Um, I'll move in a bit, a bit closer so you can see that. It's incidentally bored to um, number two Morse taper. Um, so the back gear, uh, it's a fairly traditional design. So there's a lay shaft um, and the lay shaft is on an eccentric which engages with the, the bull gear and the smaller gear on the, 
on the, the mandrel and then there's a pin which has to be removed from, from the, the pulley. So once that's removed the pulley rotates on the shaft and drives this gear through the gear train onto the bull wheel and the bull wheel is permanently attached to, uh, att attached to, the, to the, the mandrel. There are a couple of limitations. Um, uh, the drive arrangement is not so good on high speed um, and that's because of um, uh, the vis viscosity of the oil in the bearings, particularly in cold weather, and the motor and the drive is just not capable of running at high speed. But uh, in the middle speed and the lowest speed and in back gear it's all fine under all weather conditions. Okay, just moving around to the side, there's a banjo here um, uh, which enables me to do uh, screw cutting. So I had uh, three uh, gear change wheels made um, to enable me to screw, uh, to thread the uh, 12 PI thread on the mandrel. Um, so um, that is loosely modelled on a Myford ML7 mandrel size. So uh, the screw cutting uh, was done obviously on the lathe, um, as was the number two Morse uh, taper that was turned on the lathe itself. So that concludes uh, part one of making my homemade lathe. Um, it's been a pleasure to share this with you. I'll be following this up with another video soon, which um, uh, at least one more anyway. Um, it depends on uh, how, how uh, the next one goes. I think it's better to have shorter videos rather than longer ones. So maybe two or three uh, parts to the series. I'm relying on footage which I produced before we uh, returned from overseas so that makes editing a little bit challenging. I can't go back and uh, retake any of the shots. Uh, if, you, if you want to um, see subsequent videos I do suggest you hit the subscribe button. Uh, that's probably your best way of, uh, of um, getting notification that um, another video is up. So thank you for, for joining me until next time. Goodbye.